Everybody makes machetes, I mean mistakes, though I suppose that proves my point. And yes, that includes artists, I mean architects. These are the 20 biggest architectural fails. Number 20. The Sinkhole we begin by going to Guatemala City back in 2010, where a disaster killed three people. That alone is a terrible thing, but the part that we need to talk about is what caused those deaths and what caused that disaster. Because the initial report, as well as a bunch of pictures that spread across the internet at the time, was that a sinkhole had caused it. Sinkholes are depressions in the ground that expand so rapidly that they swallow up everything above it, even if it's a building with people inside. Yes, they can form almost anywhere in the world and at any time. You never want to be near a sinkhole when it's forming, period. But here's the twist. After the incident occurred and the hole was safe to investigate, it would be noted that the sinkhole was the cause of the destruction, but it wasn't a natural one. An expert said underground sewage leaks could have created a cavity that collapsed when the weight of the porous volcanic ground above increased during heavy rain. Ash from a nearby volcano that erupted a few days before may also have put extra pressure on the drains. So in other words, a terrible drainage system flooded the ground in various ways and caused a sinkhole to form in the middle of the city. That might sound ridiculous at first, but certain nations have terrible drainage systems that aren't cared for by city or government officials. There have been massive floods, for example, in one country due to the lack of care in the sewers. So to be blunt, the worst architecture decision award goes to the heads of Guatemala City for creating a sinkhole without warning anyone. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now it's time for the sweet topic. And the worst architecture decision award goes to whoever designed the slide on the left. Or actually, maybe it goes to whoever designed the sink on the right. I'm sure that I don't need to explain to you why both of these designs are a bit misjudged because you've got eyeballs. Many parents have refused to let their children use the slide because of, well, what it looks like, and it had to be dismantled. What a waste of money. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below using the hashtag Sweet Topic. Number 19. Biomuseo. After 15 years in development, 10 years of construction, four Panamanian presidential administrations, countless project delays, and $100 million spent, Panama's Biomuseo, designed by famed architect Frank Gehry, opened. That's just the opening statement, and that alone should tell you how much of a fail this building was that it took this long to make and had that many issues. Oh, and if you can't tell from the title, all of this was for a museum of biodiversity in Panama, something that really should shouldn't have taken that long or had this many problems to get going, yet that's what happened. Initial public funding for the 43,000 square foot project was secured in 2001, but it would not be until Gary signed on in 2002 that money really began to flow. In 2005, he broke ground on Biomuseo, his first project in Latin America, with a budget of $60 million. Construction would be scheduled to be completed by 2011, but it wouldn't be done until 2014 and with $40 million extra dollars in hand. Oh, but that was just for the grand opening to happen. Another $15 million in funding would be needed to complete the three remaining galleries at the time, the most expensive of which, an ambitious two-story aquatic exhibit called Oceans Divided was not set to possibly be done by 2016, so five years after the guy said he'd be done with it. Plus, if you look at the outside of the building, it doesn't really scream, this is a great museum. It kind of screams, did a child design this? There needs to be some better consideration for how some buildings are created and who designs them, because it doesn't matter if you bring in a master architect if they can't do the job on time and then stay on budget. Number 18, The Death Ray Hotel. 
We'll now head to Las Vegas to talk about the Death Ray Hotel. It wasn't really named that, but could you just picture that marketing campaign if they did? I'd stay there if the ads were catchy. Anyways, this is actually something that has to do with the Videra Hotel that was in Las Vegas back in 2010. The design of the hotel, as you can see, is curved, which in and of itself is a, not a, really a new concept. Many buildings have actually done that. The problem is not unlike certain other architectural fails, because they they didn't account for what the interior curve would do to the guests when the sun hit it. After all, what happens to curved glass when it gets hit by light? Well, it reflects it and then focuses it into a death ray. One that guests would complain about would give them sunburns, amongst other things. As the day passes on, the hot spot moves across the pool area, increasing temperatures by about 20 degrees. In early June of 2016, a guest claimed on Instagram that the pool area was 107 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot, like super duper hot, but it does get better. The fix for this was not what you would expect. You might have expected the hotel to go to the windows and maybe cover them in a layer of material that would absorb the sunlight instead of reflecting it down upon the guests. Well, no. Instead, they just put blue umbrellas all over the pool deck area. No, really, they did that and they called it finished. To be fair, it did help and uh, fewer complaints were lodged, but that doesn't really mean that the problem was solved as the death ray could affect things outside of the pool area as well. Number 17, the Quebec Bridge. Now you know you're doing something wrong in the architectural sense when you fail to make a project happen not once, but twice, and people lose their lives across the two attempts. This would be the fate and situation with the infamous Quebec Bridge. Before that bridge was built, the only way to travel from south shore of St. Lawrence to the north shore of Quebec City was to take a ferry or to use a wintertime ice bridge, neither of which exactly was the most efficient or safe, especially the one that was made out of ice. And the construction of a true bridge over the St. Lawrence River at Quebec was considered as early as 1852. The Quebec Bridge is included in the National Transcontinental Railway Project, undertaken by the federal government and first attempted, in regards to actually making the bridge, in the year 1907. At first, everything did look fine and one part of the bridge began to take shape, but then the workers realized that the weight of the bridge was above its carrying capacity. Other sections weren't checked properly either, and distortions in the bridge began to form. Though the chief engineer had warned of problems, nobody listened, and the bridge then collapsed into the river in just 15 seconds. Of the 86 workers on the bridge that day, 75 of them would be killed, and all of the rest were injured. So what did they do next? Well, they looked into what happened, and then they just simply began again, and it went as bad as you may think. On September 11th of 1916, when the central span was being raised into position, it fell into the river and it killed 13 workers. What's more, they were once again warned that this was going to happen, but once again it was ignored. Thankfully, the third time was the charm and the Quebec Bridge stands to this day. Another note, the central span, well, it's still at the bottom of the river. Number 16, Dubai Mall Aquarium. Dubai is an example of how modern times can change a place as well as a nation. I say that because the United Arab Emirates have done everything they can, within what they call reason, to make it so that their nation would be seen as a tourist destination and not just a place that's known for their oil. It's a fair endeavor when it's handled correctly. But as you no doubt know, when you fast forward to 2022 and Dubai is a sparkling attraction that many go to every year, they have some of the tallest buildings in the world and are constantly growing and expanding Dubai to fit in more attractions. One of the attractions that would be built already back in 2010 was the Dubai Mall. It's one of the largest places that you can go around and shop, and naturally it's more than just a mall. Well, it's also an aquarium. It would be designed to hold more than 33,000 living animals, representing more than 85 species, which included over 400 sharks and rays combined. They even had it so that you could go through tubes in order to see the fish above of you. So what happened? Well, it sprung a leak. 
There was a small problem. It was a simple crack and then all the water leaked out. Yes, one of the biggest aquariums out there sprung a leak in one of their tanks and the place had to be evacuated. Some of the heads of the mall tried to deny that there was a leak, but there were plenty of witness reports that stated that there was. And if anything, they should have been grateful that it was just a leak, because if the tank had burst open, that would have been a whole other thing to deal with. Appreciate the catastrophe that you missed being part of, and the fact that you didn't have sharks rushing at your face. Number 15. Shine and Sand well, look everyone, Frank Gehry is back. Surely this means that this other project couldn't have had any major fails going on with it, right? Well, wrong, because while he was in the midst of that other project I talked about before, a finished product of his was already causing problems. The shiny surface of the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, designed by Frank Gehry, opened in 2003 at a cost of $274 million, and I kid you not, it was too shiny. As noted via another building, and I'm not surprised that one wasn't made by Gary, when you get the right kind of glass reflecting sunlight, bad things can occur. Even before the building opened in October of 2003, residents and businesses had complained about the blinding glare. They also claimed that sunlight reflected from the building had caused temperatures in the vicinity to rise to 138 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than what was going on in Las Vegas by 20 degrees. Gary attributed the problem with the Disney Hall to an error in construction rather than a failing of his original plan, to which I say, yeah, right. Some of the curving sheets of metal that he claimed were installed at a slightly different angle than specified in the plans, and thus caused the bright shine and the heat to increase. But I mean, just hear me out on this one. He screwed up again, Frank, and people got hurt. The best part? The way that they went about fixing it was not to redo the walls, but to sandblast them into submission. Personally, I would have loved to have been on the team doing that, because it was probably a blast. Number 14. Falling Water this structure was made by American architect Frank Lloyd Wright for the Kaufman family. Wright's hailed as being one of the greatest architects of all time, and as a result, when he was contracted to make this piece, perfection and beauty was expected. The result was falling water, a place that mixed man-made architecture with natural beauty. And the Kaufmans lived in the house for decades, which they were actually lucky to have survived in. Because as we would now know, the house that is falling water was a ticking time bomb of architectural failures and shortcuts. Falling water experienced a structural failure in its concrete frame that would have eventually progressed to a catastrophic result. Structural failures in reinforced concrete can be progressive, and it typically begins with cracking followed by excessive deflection. This is precisely what occurred at falling water while construction was still underway. Cracking and excessive deflection are, by definition, a structural failure because the design is not intended to behave in that manner. There's no record of a reshoring design, and the supporting braces placed after the forms were removed appear to have been randomly placed, more out of convenience than design itself. Funnily enough, the Kaufman family did have issues with the home, but Wright fought back. He made the house good enough to live in, but not good enough to last. While the structure is still upright currently, it's not exactly a shining beacon of architectural wonder, like some noted when it was first debuted to the public and the press. Oh, and had falling water collapsed while the Kaufmans were the owners, Wright would have been held responsible due to how the laws were back then. Number 13. Queen Sophia Palace. Now, have you ever looked at something and gone, well, that's way too elaborate? The Queen Sofia Palace is one such place. It's an opera house in Valencia, Spain that opened back in 2005. It too was a place revered at first due to the architect behind it, one Mr. Calatrava. Yet as time went on, the issues of the place and its design began to show in many ways. 
Mr. Calatrava covered the opera house with thousands of tiny mosaic tiles using a technique made famous over a century earlier by someone in Barcelona. But the Valencia authorities threatened to sue Mr. Calatrava last month after chunks fell off in high winds, forcing the closing of the building ahead of Christmas performances. Well, the last thing you want is one of your big tourist destinations being shut down before Christmas. The cost of fixing this tile disaster was about $4 million, but the insult to Mr. Calatrava didn't end there. Instead of replacing the mosaic tiles, the building was to be painted white. Yes, his great work of art was now going to be painted white. How absolutely basic. Also, how repetitive, as the architects known for his projects going wrong, either because of budget overruns or construction defects. Usually that would be enough to ensure that a man like him doesn't get another architect contract, but as we've already shown you, if you're a big name in building things, you tend to get a pass, or even 10 of them. Number 12. West Side Shopping and Leisure Center. Picture right now, you're in a shopping center that you go to on the regular. It can be one that you've got in your nearest big city or perhaps in another state to have fun every once in a while. Whatever you want. When you go into that place, what do you expect outside of a shopping experience? Well, you expect to be safe, to walk into that mall and then walk out of it only with a little extra weight because of the stuff you bought. However, the West Side Shopping and Leisure Center in Bern, Switzerland didn't have that stability and people got hurt as a result, twice in fact, because the roof of the center collapsed not once, but twice since it was completed in 2008. Now that's not good by any metric. 100 square miles of the gypsum board ceiling and insulation over an indoor swimming pool fell 10 meters onto the floor. The previous collapse occurred in 2008 in a fast food outlet, so not only did it happen twice, it happened in two different places, which basically indicates we should all be grateful it didn't happen in many other spots. The center had a sauna, spa, cinema, shopping area, hotel, and restaurants, as it was supposed to be a gateway place to experience burn as a whole, which is something many people would have happily partaken in. But after hearing about the collapse of the roofs, would you really want to go into that place? Number 11, Guangzhou Opera House. There are two major ways that you can fail a construction project. You can fail to do something right the first time and have issues like collapsing roofs or reflective death ray mirrors. Or you can just suck from the beginning and have the place basically falling apart by the time that it opens. This last one was the case with the Guangzhou Opera House. In 2011, it would be reported that the Opera House was already falling apart and had only been open for a few months. The deputy manager of contractors allegedly said that it had been extremely difficult to fulfill the vision and that the complexity of the scheme had initially been underestimated. Now, that might be putting it lightly because apparently there were parts of the walls and ceiling that was coming down and water had been seeping into the structure. Water damage leads to all sorts of other damages and again this building had only opened a few months prior, which means the problems were already there and they opened the place anyways. We're only halfway through the list, and I can't help but wonder how many architects and companies allowed such failures to happen. Number 10, Second Narrows Bridge Collapse. It's been a bit since we talked about a bridge coming down, so let's fix that. One sunny afternoon instantly turned dark for Lucien Lessard on June 17th of 1958 as he plunged into the ocean when a support collapsed on a highway bridge being constructed between Vancouver and North Vancouver. That event would cost the lives of 23 people, which included a diver that was trying to search for bodies in the river below. Lessard was actually the last living person from that incident. The collapse occurred near quitting time about 3.40 p.m. when iron workers toiling 40 meters above the inlet heard a horrific noise as span number five began to crash into the inlet in a mass of tangled steel. When you look at the pictures of it, you're kind of amazed that anyone survived at all. The cause of it was mistakes by a lead engineer that weren't caught until it was too late. Number nine, Walkie Scorchy. Remember the Death Ray Hotel? Well, this is an upgraded version of that, because in 2014, a London skyscraper began to do incredible things with heat. 
mainly, not unlike certain Las Vegas hotel, it had a curb design that would catch and focus the sun's rays to raise the temperature. But here's where the twist comes in. It was so bad that it wasn't only burning the people below, it was actually melting cars. Yes, really, it was a literal heat ray, which is just a step below the death ray, and people were not happy about it. This would be a 200 million euro skyscraper, and now it had to be outfitted with special shading on the windows to absorb and diffuse the sunlight so that the reflection wouldn't occur. As you can guess, it was not cheap to do. It also would be later accused of causing a wind tunnel, but we'll just stop beating this dead horse. Number 8. Ray and Maria Stata Center Guess who's back? Because the Ray and Maria Stata Center was supposed to be a major new learning center for MIT in the early 2000s, and to ensure that they got the right look and design, they hired one certain man to help them out. That's right, Frank Gehry. He's back. And if you're lining up the times, you know that this is right around the time of the other failed projects as well. And this failed project was so bad that MIT actually sued him. They alleged that Gary was negligent in designing the building and that he and his partner breached their contractual obligation. Apparently, as early as late summer of 2004, it would be discovered that considerable masonry cracking existed in the amphitheater's seating areas, and it was caused by improper amounts of spacing of control joints in the brick masonry. That drainage design was flawed in that it failed to include a drainage mat under the brick. Gary claimed that the issues were minor and that MIT was after their insurance. Number 7. Lotus Riverside Block Back in 2009, Shanghai would be shocked out of its slumber by the sound of a 13-story tower block crashing to the ground. It's not good by any means, but what made it worse was the reason for it all. An investigation report would reveal the collapse had been caused by the foundations being undermined by a combination of dugout soil being pressed against one side of the building and an underground tunnel being dug out on the other side. Oh, but that's not all of it. The company overseeing the project was warned about this possibility and they actually ignored it. People died and lost investments that were then put into the building complex. Number 6. The Standard Oil Building the 802,000-square-foot downtown Manhattan building at 26 Broadway used to house the headquarters of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. Yes, that J.D. Rockefeller, one of the most infamous people in all of history. He was a ruthless oil tycoon that did whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, because he had all the money to throw around and ensure that he got what he wanted. It took a literal President of the United States to put him in his place, and even then, he still got to live large in this massively overdone building. Now, the fail here is not in the architecture per se, but rather in how it was meant to dwarf everything around it and eventually got outbuilt. Because when you live in New York, things don't stay small ever. Number 5. The Hindenburg did you really think that architecture only applied to buildings? Vehicles have had architects come and help out with plans before, and the ones who worked on the Hindenburg likely went down in flames just like that Zeppelin did. On May 6th of 1937, the Hindenburg would be coming in from a flight to land in Manchester Township, New Jersey, but just when it was about to touch down, it burst into a massive fireball that injured some and killed many others. So where's the fail? Well, it's twofold. First, due to an embargo, the German-crafted Zeppelin had to be filled with hydrogen instead of helium. Helium is not flammable, but hydrogen is. What's more, as proven by Mythbusters, the skin of the blimp, which was meant to reflect heat from the sun, actually helped to fuel the fire when it occurred, causing the whole thing to go up in under 30 seconds. Oh, the humanity. Number 4. Leaning Tower of Pisa the Leaning Tower of Pisa is easily one of the most known and recognizable architectural fails in history. It would take 200 years to make, and yet when they revealed it in its full in 1372, it was already leaning. It leans at 3.2 degrees off vertical, which may not seem like much at all at first, but it is out actually a lot. And what's more, it didn't stop there. 
The foundation wasn't strong enough to handle the tower, so the tower continued to sink and lean, and it took up until the 1990s to stop it through a stability fix. But even still, it leans to this day. That's why, while you can go and see the leaning tower right now without issue, there's a limit of how many people can actually go inside at one time. Number 3. Tacoma Narrows Bridge now, when you're known as a landmark failure in engineering history, you know you did something wrong. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge stood in Washington State until it collapsed in a most spectacular fashion, and naturally. By that, I mean that on the morning of November 7th of 1940, it suffered collapse via a wind of about 42 miles per hour. Now, to some of you, that may seem odd. Winds go across bridges all the time, even strong ones. So why would this one buckle due to that? The difference is support and flexibility. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was an incredibly flexible bridge, so once the winds picked up, the bridge warped and whipped and broke. The good news is that the bridge was closed at the time, so no one was injured or killed. Furthermore, this collapse would inspire further research on aerodynamic forces and the effect of winds on structures like bridges. So this mistake actually turned into a lot of safe bridges eventually. Number 2. Kemper Arena The collapse of the roof at the Kemper Arena in Kansas City in 1979 was an ironic moment for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was that one day before that, there was a convention taking place. One of architects. That's right, a convention of architects that happily noted that the Kemper Arena was one of the finest buildings in the nation. Then fast forward 24 hours later and the roof was gone. So what happened between the convention and the collapse? Well, my best guess is that Frank Gehry got a hold of it for revenge. But what really happened was a massive storm that pounded the roof and exploited a key flaw. The structural engineer from California who came out to survey the incident found that the collapse was caused by a failure of hangar bolt, which bound the roof's steel trusses to its hangers. Number 1. John Hancock Tower when you walk by a tall building, you don't expect anything to fall from it and onto you. It could happen, but it's unlikely. The exception was the infamous John Hancock Tower, which had a number of structural failures that got its builders in trouble over the years. But the biggest issue that they unintentionally caused was that of falling window. Basically, when they put the windows into the building, they didn't bond the three layers within them properly. So when the winds pick up, the windows would vibrate and instead come loose and drop to the ground. When the winds were above 45 miles per hour, the area around the entire building was closed off. Other failures were a concern for unstable foundation and an abnormal amount of movement that caused occupants on higher levels to experience motion sickness, so the building was full of problems. That's all from the realm of architecture and how things can fail so spectacularly if you don't do it right the first time. Which of these fails really had you shaking your head? And are you glad that you weren't near any of them when they happened? Are there any others that should be on this list? Be sure to let me know all about it in the comment section down below. Check out the other cool things that are showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time.